Aloha. Welcome to Figments, the Power of Imagination. I'm your host, Dan Leaf, and I go by Fig. That is why the show has this name. Sometimes I talk about peace. Sometimes I talk about flying. Today I'm talking about war. I'm going to talk to you about acing the test. Wait, Ace wasn't spelled correctly there. My dog's name is Ace with one C. But 20 years ago, I was the director of the Ace with the land component during the invasion of Iraq, Operation Iraqi Freedom, March 2003. It was an interesting role. First of all, it was an interesting arrival in the combat zone. I was working in the Pentagon. I had a really good job as the director of operational requirements for the Air Force looking at the future of the Air Force, but I'm not a Pentagon guy. And as we built up towards the invasion, as the crisis mounted, uh, I looked at a slide that showed where all the Air Force generals were going to be for that conflict, having been a wing commander in combat as one star. And I looked at that chart and saw there was no place for me. Now, I love peace. You've heard me talk many times about peace, especially with regard to North Korea. I'm about to have an article published in a major outlet on that topic. But I guess the contradiction is, if there's a war that our our country is fighting, I want to be in it. I'm a fighter. I'm a fighter pilot. And so I was quite depressed to look at that chart and say, dude, you're watching this one on the television. Not what I had in mind. After seeing that chart and briefing, I went back to my office on the fifth floor there in the Pentagon, uh, the, in the E-ring, the same ring that had been struck two years earlier on the September 11th attack. And as I get into my office, the phone rang. And it was the guy who was going to be the air commander during the invasion, then Lieutenant General Buzz Mosley. I'd known General Mosley for years from the time when we were both captains in Okinawa, Japan, and he called me and said, Fig, I'd like you to be my representative with the land component in Kuwait and then into Iraq during the invasion that we think is going to happen. My response, true story, as far as I can remember, was, sir, I'll do anything. Make me a human shield. Just get me out of the Pentagon. A little lighthearted, but the Pentagon is not my kind of place. In fact, I have put in my uh, will that I'd like to be buried in a plot at Arlington that overlooks the Pentagon so that I'll know for all eternity things could be worse. I'm not a Pentagon guy. And I was happy to serve and happy to serve in combat and work for General Mosley. And I knew the Army. That's why I was picked, I'm told. Because I'd uh, been a Ford Air Controller, an air liaison officer, you've seen some Figments episodes about that. With the Army in Korea, I'd attended the Army's Command and General Staff College and stayed there on the faculty. I knew a bunch of the folks who were senior leaders by that time in the Army, and uh, I thought I was pretty well suited for it. In fact, I'd also served as an Air Force Colonel in Korea, but with a largely Army headquarters and and new folks like General Gary Luck, who was the commander there, and my boss, General Larry Ellis. So I knew the Army. I spoke Army. I didn't think Army, because airmen think differently, and that difference is important. But the difference can cause friction in war, and that's what General Mosley wanted to avoid. He wanted to have a representative inside the headquarters, inside the land headquarters as we invaded Iraq, who could reduce the friction, talk straight scoop with the land commander at a at a credible level, and um, help the war go better, help to achieve victory sooner, and reduce loss of life on both sides. Yes, on both sides. So he said, Fig, you're going to be the director of a first ever air component coordination element. What's that? I said, I'd never heard of it. He said, well, we tried it once during an operation, but this is our first large scale application of the concept. And you'll be uh, my representative to the land commander. You'll have a small team that makes sure you can stay coordinated and synchronized with my headquarters quarters, and in touch and well informed with the land headquarters so that you can be that critical conduit with the between the two components. 
And the components were called C flick and in uh, the C FAC, C flick combined forces land component commander. That was General Dave McKiernan. And then the C FAC combined forces air component commander, General Mosley. I'm not going to mention many other names simply because I hadn't talked to folks. I haven't talked to folks about can I talk about them? And uh, so I'll respect their privacy, but there were real people involved in that. And the real people that I needed first were those on my team. Uh, it was an ideal situation because General Mosley said, pick the folks you want and take them over to Iraq. I've got a picture of the group as it matured. We started uh, with about uh, 10 when we deployed. This is about 18 folks. We got some admin uh, troops in theater, a security guy to uh, keep us alive. We thought that important. And then some coalition forces and other service airmen onto the team. Uh, but it was generally hand-picked. And I picked folks mostly because I knew they could do the job in combat. When I was getting ready for this show, uh, my wife Alejandra asked me, she said, well, did you just call them and say, hey, go to the war? Or how did that work? And did any of them refuse? You know, I don't remember, but I know the kind of guys I asked, and I don't think they refused. There were a mixed bag of folks. Um, I had uh, a fighter pilot, uh, a couple of fighter pilots, actually, uh, intelligence special officer, a space guy, really critical. Can't overstate, even 20 years ago, the importance of space in uh, the mix and having good appreciation for what's available, what the capabilities are, and how you can apply them rapidly to a tactical situation. Um, so a collection of folks, and I had one guy, I'll call him Mad Dog because that's what I called him, who was just an old friend. He'd been my deputy in an earlier job, and I had Mad Dog there because he could translate for me. I knew that I was going to be busy, that sometimes I can be abrupt and um, and not take the time to explain, go do this. Here's what I want. I'm out. I'm going to go do something else, leaving folks to sort it out. And I knew that if Mad Dog was there, there'd be less sorting because he'd say what the general meant to say is. Uh, but it was a perfect mix of specialties and personalities. And uh, sadly, we haven't kept in much touch. And that's part of why I'm doing this episode is to remember how willing these people were to serve in a combat environment and uh, on very short notice doing a job that hadn't even been invented yet. So once we identified folks, we had to invent the job and decide what it was. And what we uh, decided on, I have here a book, little green book, little ledger book that the Army loves. And I, I have probably 15 of these from various times in my career where I captured my notes, what we decided the role was to be was for me to be that constant pipe, the sort of human fiber optic, optic cable between the land commander and the air commander, both of whom were really busy, with a staff that allowed me to do a good job at that by keeping me informed, staying in touch with the temperature of the water within the headquarters, uh, et cetera, the land headquarters. And uh, that was in the pre-war environment. I wouldn't say peacetime because, in fact, uh, Desert Storm, the original invasion of Iraq, didn't even end with an armistice. I mean, geez, even the Korean War ended with an, what was paused by an armistice, and that hadn't even happened there. So we'd be, been at a steady flow of tensions working out of Kuwait and Saudi Arabia for about 12 years by that time. So there were peacetime constructs or not war constructs in headquarters methods and processes and meetings and everything else. And we had to integrate into that. And this team helped me do that, this break team. One of the things I found we had to watch out for, though, was not to be drawn into it, not to be taken prisoner by the headquarters. More on that in a second. So as we identified the folks and got everybody together, uh, about two weeks after I was told we we're going to go do this undefined thing, we left for Iraq. Uh, I had an idea of the job, and I had my people, 
Well, we've gotten our weapons and our gear and our chemical warfare stuff and our uh, flak vests or, or body armor. Uh, but I didn't know what environment I was going into because only a couple of the army officers in the headquarters did I have any real knowledge of. I didn't know the, the commander, General Dave McKiernan, at all. Uh, the other two stars, I didn't know yet, but I would. And um, so I wasn't sure how I'd be received. And frankly, from going into new situations as an outsider, especially as an airman in an army environment, I expected challenges, friction, resistance, skepticism, all the things that one might reasonably expect. But serendipitously, when we got to the airport to deploy to Iraq from Dulles to uh, Kuwait City International Airport in uh, early February of 2003. On the same flight was the same General Gary Luck I mentioned uh, as having been my boss in Korea. Uh, General Luck is a very distinguished combat warrior, leader, brilliant mind, and revered by anybody who served with him, I think. I can't imagine anybody not respecting the, this great man and really a true, he'd hate us, he'd hate me calling this hero. But he was on the same flight. We rekindled our uh, friendship. It was a work-based friendship. I had been a colonel. He was a four-star, but it's great to see him. And we flew on the same flight to Kuwait and arrived there. And of course, because he was who he was, General McKiernan met him at the airport. And General Luck, kept me by his side for that meeting. And he said to General McKiernan something to the effect of, hey, this is Dan Lynch, you can trust him. That was it, okay? All in the storming and norming and getting into the circle was done. Because General, not because of me, because General Luck's word was so powerful. I can only speculate how differently our role would have played out there there in this war had I not had that introduction from General Locke. And thank God for that. So now we go to the headquarters. The reason I was picked as a two-star general was all of the staff deputies, the next level but below General McKiernan, were also um, two stars. And it makes it a lot easier to have a conversation and not have rank get in the way. So we got into the headquarters and we started integrating. As I said, the important thing to do was not be subsumed. My folks were there to make me successful. They weren't there to fill the empty space that the Army had. And that's not a reflection on the Army. Any organization that has its own needs is going to fill them with what's ever available, especially in a combat environment. Now, let's... Take that, and for those of you who served in combat uh, or in intense military operations, I think you'll appreciate that. If you hadn't, uh, understand why I was there is reflected by that need to stay separate from the Army staff and, and be our own entity and do our own job. And that's because combat is a matter of life and death, he says, stating the absolute obvious. But it's a matter of life and death with commanders having unique responsibilities to achieve operational goals and um, keep their folks alive. A couple of really important things. And so they're naturally jealous of resources, suspicious of outsiders, worried about what kind of support they might or might not get from other folks, like the land forces, worried about the support they might get from the Air Force, and kind of skeptical about that. And it isn't that either side can't be trusted. It's that it's hard to trust when their lives and mission success depending on. It. So um, being there in the house at the right level in the two star meetings with the commander that gave me a chance to say, yeah, well, the Air Force will do this or no, the Air Force can't do that. And here's why they can't do it. And for those, if, those of you who may be or may have been in the Army, the Air Force doesn't elect not to do things to support the land component out of spite. It just doesn't all go back to our separation in 1947, our divorce in 1947. It's usually because the Joint Force Commander, 
whomever that might be. In this case, it was General Tommy R. Franks that said, hey, air component, I need you to do this first. And uh, this may not be direct support to the land battle. And in fact, I looked at some of the flow in my magic green notebook and said, and saw that, as I remembered, the first couple of days of the war were very predominantly towards what we would call strategic targets. Not because that was the choice of General Mosley. He might have chosen it had he been the, the overall uh, commander, but because it was the choice of Army Officer General Franks, who told him what to do. Um, that friction came up a couple times. I'll mention one of them in a minute. And to be able to talk about what our what the air component's direction was from the overall uh, commander with the army in their meetings, when people are pulling their hair out trying to figure out how to win, um, I think was very valuable, very valuable. And, and it sounds like uh, I don't know if it sounds silly or not, but it was the human side of leadership and command in combat. Now, one caveat that I meant to give early on, I'm talking about this war. I was a participant in it. I wasn't doing any shooting, folks, so there's nothing heroic about, about my part of this. I was there, all right? I think I did a pretty good job in a reasonably tough environment, but the soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines who are doing the real deal deserve the credit, not this. Yeah, but even then, I was an old general. So... Now we're integrating into the headquarters, figuring out who's who in the zoo and what we need to uh, do, what meetings we need to be in, all of them, uh, who the key players were at the colonel level, uh, all those things. We also had to figure out what we would do once we went into Iraq. And frankly, that was very undefined. Would we go forward with the land forces? Would we stay behind in Kuwait? And that wasn't clear at all. So we had to get ready to move. There's just one problem. We were a pickup team. We had good folks. We'd gotten enough personal gear and weapons, but <laughs> we had nothing else. We didn't have radios, and we certainly didn't have a, a vehicle. So one of the things I made sure I had, had on my team was a scrounger. And that scrounger found us an up-armored Humvee. We didn't own it. I don't know what we traded to get it. I probably can't stand an audit of that. So, you know, if any of you really don't like me, you, maybe you could write your congressman. But anyway, one of our uh, team found this up-armored, unused Humvee in in uh, Qatar, as I recall, and had it shipped to Camp Doha, Kuwait, where we were. It was in sorry shape. So what did we do? We bartered with the local maintenance support um, organization run by contract Kuwaitis mostly, as I recall, and got them to prepare this vehicle for combat. By the time they were done, we had the nicest up-armored Humvee in all of Kuwait. That's me with my ride there. But isn't that a beauty? We, In the end, we wouldn't use it very much, but it was a nice ride. And we never got the 50 cal to mount in the turret, but but we could have. As it turned out, many of us did go into Iraq briefly, but things happened so fast that it isn't like we um, were bivouacked or, or operating in Iraq initially. We did go out in the field where the land forces were gathered uh, quite a bit. Uh, to liaise with the land commanders and talk to them and take that airman's perspective out to the tactical level, usually to assistant division commanders or uh, army division op ops officers. Um, and sometimes to say, uh, yeah, the Air Force can't do that for you. Other times to say, don't do this without the Air Force. And I remember one in particular where uh, I think it was a, I, I don't, I won't say uh, Division G3, maybe, but a relatively senior leader who was talking about their plans to conduct a large-scale attack helicopter operation without Air Force suppression of enemy air defenses. <laughs> so, you know, it's a bad idea. Let us help. Let us help. And eventually they did. So that was the kind of value we added. We met with other uh, senior leaders to 
generally just confer and build trust. You may recognize um, some of the folks, hey, that's General Brigadier General Austin, now known as Secretary of Defense Austin. Again, having uh, conversations about how the Air Force can cannot help, answering questions and being present. You know, a virtual presence is actual absence. And if nothing else, one thing that this role that was envisioned by General Mosley really did was put a face to air, to the Air Force, to the air component. So that I was what we weren't just that anonymous other part of the war that didn't care about the land force. Sounds sophomore, silly, I don't know, but but it was really important, I think. And and I think that those on the ground side who were there would share that thought with me. So um at uh as we got ready to go across the berm, there were a lot of issues to consider, like would we go to war or not? Would we um, encounter weapons of mass destruction? You know, this may, that may have been what I was talking about with General Austin. I will tell you, you can look at all of the historical data on WMD. We thought they were there. We believed they were there. Looking at the most highly classified information available, we believed they were there. We believed they'd be used against us, but they weren't. So we talked about the fact that this was a preemptive war, striking first because of weapons of mass destruction. And frankly, I'm still troubled by that rationale, um, especially given how the war turned out. And um, I think that we lost the opportunity to more fully ra uh, uh, rationalize why we went into uh, into uh, Iraq. Now, the entry into Iraq was uh, kind of interesting. <laughs> the start of the war was kind of interesting from my perspective because we have a timeline. I'll have it in this book after the fact. Uh, and so as the timeline approached and we're ready and uh, to go across the berm, as we said, launch combat operations, beginning with the shock and awe, I think it was called. Um, I went back to my quarters, my little uh, room apartment thing there on Kuwait City to get a shower, grab some food, put on a fresh uniform, you know, because I knew that I'd be kind of busy. And as I'm there, I'm probably heating up SpaghettiOs or something on the stove uh, with the TV on, I am notified by CNN that the war has already started without me. Not kidding. The war started without me. Can you believe that? Uh, how did that happen? Human intel reached the uh, headquarters of the components that said that Saddam Hussein was in a certain place at a certain time. And so an airstrike was launched early. He was not there. I bring that up not just to kind of be bemused at the fact that um, I was not, you know, I was caught by surprise by the start of the war, but also to talk about the fragility and the unreliability inherent to human intel. Turned out that the reporting guy had a different axe to grind, not with Saddam, and we went on bad information. So their intelligence is never perfect, and that was proven by what happened or didn't happen with weapons of mass destruction. So combat operations started, and uh, things happened rapidly. Very rapidly. Uh, we, I went into Iraq for the first time in uh, up to Talil Air Base. And uh, we'll get to that in just a minute. I think I have a break slide here. Uh, first, let me say that I'll be back with my next episode in two weeks here on Think Tech, the Power of Imagination, or on Figments, the Power of Imagination. April 11th, and I look forward to seeing you there. I never get to actually see you, but I'd really look forward to hearing you. See see where that arrow says write to fig? I get a couple of emails on occasion, sometimes telling me what I should or shouldn't talk about. I would love to hear from you and hear what you'd like, what topic you'd like ad addressed on uh, figments, the power of imagination. So drop me a note. And we go into Iraq. And 
things go well. And before I know it, I'm up at Tulil Air Base, where I once patrolled in an F-15 during no-fly zone enforcement in an enemy squadron. There I am with Saddam's bus there. Uh, it was unbelievable. We're, we're there. There are already A-10 aircraft operating out of this Iraqi airfield. Uh, things happen so rapidly that I don't know that we, it's not just that we didn't appreciate it, we didn't know what to do with that. There were even um, press media up there. And I did an interview, as I did many interviews with uh, folks up at Talil Air Base, now uh, Nazaria Airport is what it's called. Yeah. I did another interview, and I'm going to tie that back to our expectations of weapons of mass destruction and uh, tell you that I did an interview with a well-known CNN journalist whose name shall remain, uh, well, well, I won't name him, um, in a hotel in Kuwait. And when I went into his hotel room for this interview, I found that he had uh two canaries in a cage, canaries in a cage, as if in a coal mine, because he was worried about a chemical weapons attack. So all those who say we knew there weren't any weapons of mass destruction are wrong. And we were attacked. Some 12 to 16, a number's not clear, Ababil 100 uh, missiles were launched by Iraqis at our first our headquarters and then deployed forces. And in one attack, they killed three soldiers at a, at a forward headquarters. I remember those attacks. We had a couple of them there at the headquarters in Kuwait. And we were certain they carried chemical weapons. That's just what we believe. The attacks would go like this. And I'm going to say it in the time it took. And I'd like you to kind of uh, internalize this. We're in the headquarters, working our coordination and communications efforts, have on our chemical suits, except for gloves and masks. A siren sounds. We take our gas mask out of the pouch on our hip, put it on, put on our gloves, and hear a Patriot launch with the siren still sounding. The Patriot rocket roars off into the night sky. There's an explosion as the warhead detonates in the proximity of the Ababil 100. And now shrapnel rains down on the roof of the headquarters we're in from either the warhead or the missile. Don't know which. All that happened in the time it just took me to describe it. It was that fast because the range was so close. Siren, mask, launch the Patriot, hit the target, and then it's over. There were never any chemical weapons, but we sure thought there were. And when we approached the phase line where uh, we thought Iraqi forces would resort to chemical weapons, man, we were scared for our troops that were forward crossing that line. We launched emergency airstrikes on artillery units that we thought could um, could execute a chemical strike. We thought they were there. Uh, but before we know it, we're in Baghdad. No chemical weapons. We're in Baghdad on 7 April. And I'll meet with General McKiernan and my buddies from the war on the 7th of April to reflect on our experience. And uh, on the 7th, I flew up to Baghdad. There's a picture of me with my buddy, Saddam. Uh, flew up to Baghdad in a C-17. General Mosley and I, uh, one of the first nights in the war, landed on a blacked out, or in Baghdad, landed on a blacked out taxiway in this C-17 that ingressed at low level. Things are still pretty dang hot. Uh, there we are. And essentially, psychologically, for us, the war's over. It wasn't, as we know. Iraqi freedom, as a named operation, continued for another seven and a half or eight years. And then beyond that. Um, somebody said to me as we were there, Big, now I know how the Romans felt. And at that moment, I thought, 
oh man, this is not that easy. And it wasn't. And we saw what unfolded afterwards. Uh, after that trip to Baghdad, I went back to uh, Kuwait City and then to Camp Doha, worked from there. But we thought combat operations were all in the mop up phase. phase. I actually had a video interview for a three star job, a promotion to move to Air Force Space Command, Vice Commander, by video link with General or with uh, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld. And uh, that eventually was confirmed by the Senate. And so I left in late April, a month. My war was basically a month. And the rest of the war, the war was a lot longer. In my notebook, I found a phrase that captured what I think this was, catastrophic success. We were so successful so early that we didn't know what to do with it. And I don't know if those of us who were initially in the headquarters take the blame or those after. I don't know that it matters. But the success came so rapidly that we didn't transition well. We also didn't recognize the significance, in my mind, to irregular uh, fighters like the Saddam Fadeen and other irregular groups, paramilitary groups. In my notebook, I found a, another annotation of something else that really affected the outcome of governance of uh, Iraq post-invasion. It says that the, the, the annotation to myself is nobody has been found in any jail. One of the things Saddam Hussein had done is empty all the prisons into society. And that criminal element, I believe, facilitated the insurrection, the insurgency, and everything else bad that happened to Iraq. And I don't know that we recognize that either. More important, most importantly, I don't think we had a good we, the United States and our coalition, had a good plan for governance. We couldn't just hand it over to Iraq, and I think we're too kid-gloved about who was in charge and needed to approach it closer to occupation than to nation building. That's a whole other story, but Iraq had failed as a nation. It wasn't just Saddam Hussein had been a brutal despot. He had, but they lost the capacity for self-governance, and that had to be built up as it was for Germany and Japan post-war. So I abruptly departed, and the rest is tragically uh, sad and long and brutal for Iraq. I, I think the United States failed morally and that we didn't deliver a better future to Iraq, no matter how difficult it is. That isn't a blame that goes to a political party or not, but if you broke it, it is your duty to fix it. And we haven't done that. And I'm saddened by that. I don't know what else to say. So, well, Fig do. First of all, I'd be real careful about entering conflict. A lot more careful than the United States and others have been lately. And secondly, if you do it, do it as we did, ready to win, and then ready to deal with the aftermath. So that's a brief version of my experience in Operation Iraqi Freedom 20 years ago. I was there. And uh, I hope you've learned something from my stories. If you want to learn from my other Figments episodes, you can take a look at this QR code thing here, and uh, you'll see both Figments, The Power of Imagination, and my old show, Figments on Reality. Uh, look those up. There's some fun stuff. There's some funny stuff. There's some great friends. And then there's serious stuff like this and a conversation about North Korea, which hopefully, hopefully, will be reflected in a major newspaper soon. That's a hint, but I have to make sure it's confirmed. Uh, but please tune into those episodes. And as always, remember that we rely on uh, donations at this great nonprofit, Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, this is their our spring fund drive. We need your help. Please go to their website, click on donate, or find some other way to support citizen journalism. Think Tech Hawaii brings you figments, the power of imagination, and I'll see you next episode. Mahalo. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii.
If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo. Thank you.